a sort of a pastoral word at the beginning uh, of our lesson today, and I know we still have people joining us. Um, I, I, I was speaking with a friend on the phone last night from church um, who, who, in this wonderful effort to call and check on everyone. Hi, Kristen. And uh, as, as we talked, uh, I was asking her how she and her family were doing. And uh, she said, you know, most of the time I'm okay, but sometimes I'm not. And I think that is where so many of us find ourselves at these days. Uh, the, the drain of this pandemic life and the uncertainty of it and all that's going on is a tremendous, tremendous emotional, uh, well, uh, one pastor I was talking to this past week uh, just called it a soul suck. I mean, it just seems like it sucks the life out of you. Hi, Carla and Rudy. Um, just seems like when you least expect it, something comes up. I was reading the newspaper this morning. Not a sad story, but actually a happy story about um, something. And just started crying because uh, just the reality of the life we're in right now and the adaptations that are having to be made and then there's so much to be thankful for, uh, even in the midst of this. And we were having this conversation with some friends last night, and, um, and, and one of them said, yeah, that's true, but it didn't have to be this way. It didn't have to be this way. And I think we all have frustration that things have played out in a way that uh, have maybe made things worse than they, than they had to be, and continue to uh, with this. And the... Uh, the difficulty we have had in America in adapting uh, to all of this is, um, I, I think, equally frustrating. And so, if nothing else, this morning, I just want to affirm that if you're feeling sad, if you feel frustrated, if you have bouts of up and down, you're not alone in that. I think most of us are there in some way or another. And we handle it in different ways and we act out from it in different ways. Some of us stuff it in, some of us lash out, some of us hide. Um, but I, the, the long-term toll of this is, um, I, I think, the, the big unknown. And some of you are much more qualified than I am to speak to that. But there is a, there is a justification for feeling the way you feel right now. And, I just wanted to say that if you're in that place, um, give yourself some grace uh, because you're not alone. And there is another day coming. Uh, we will get through this. It's just not knowing when that makes it so difficult, right? Hi, Kathy. Glad to have you join us today. Well, um, I hope you're keeping up with all the church news. Uh, I'm not doing a great job of that myself now that I don't produce it, but. Um, I see some stuff now and then, and am grateful for that, and um, especially grateful that today uh, in worship, uh, the church is celebrating Jessica Capp's uh, 20th anniversary uh, on our staff, and Jessica's been an outstanding minister and colleague and uh, so uh, gracious in her work with our, with our senior adults, uh, and I hope you'll say a word of congratulations to her. Hi, Michael. Good to see you, too. Uh, so, we're going to continue in 1 Corinthians today, and uh, we're, we're plugging along. I sent you all, uh, if you were paying attention to the um, Discovery Class Facebook page, uh, I, I, I sent you, um, or posted yesterday, uh, an image, and uh, it's, it's there on the page if you want to look at it, but you don't want to get out of the live stream. Here, here it is. Let's see if I can figure out how to do this. Okay. So this is a famous painting by the German uh, artist Edvard Munch. Uh, and you probably are familiar with some of his other work, right? But this is a piece called Golgotha. And I want you to think as we look at this piece about the construction of it and think about uh, what is the central focus of this painting. Well, it doesn't take uh, a rocket scientist or an art major to tell you that the, the crucifixion, that Jesus on the cross is the central figure of this 
particular painting. And I chose this because it illustrates that so clearly. Everything else in this painting is focusing on Christ on the cross. He is the central figure in this painting. He is not the only figure in this painting, but everything else takes its direction from Christ on the cross. And I chose this painting to illustrate the lesson that Paul is trying to teach us in this passage from 1 Corinthians today. Uh, we're going to be reading, if you have your Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. At least I hope we'll get all the way to verse 13. Yeah, Kristen, that's a good, why, why are they looking away? Why are those people looking away? And I think that's a, uh, a, a wonderful question about that particular piece. Certainly there are many others uh, of the crucifixion where everyone's looking at the cross. Um, my first hunch is that uh, th this is the shame, this is the, um, the derision, this is the horror. Uh, probably the latter as much as anything, uh, that it's unbearable, unbearable to see. Um, and I think that makes Paul's lesson to us all the more um, important today. So we're picking up in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 at verse 1. When I came to you, brothers and sisters, I did not come proclaiming the mystery of God to you in lofty words or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I came to you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. My speech and my proclamation were not with plausible words of wisdom, but with a demonstration of the spirit and of power, so that your faith might rest not on human wisdom, but on the power of God. Well, this is just the, uh, the preamble to the section we're looking at today, and it follows on everything we've talked about in, in chapter one, uh, leading uh, up to this. Uh, Paul is painting a picture for us here. He's painting a picture for the Corinthians. Uh, and in doing that, he is telling us that in life's picture, Christ must be the central figure. And not just Christ, but in his view, <clears throat> Christ crucified must be. And we might pause and ask, okay, well, but why Christ crucified and not Christ resurrected? Uh, and this is one of the interesting things about um, church art uh, in religious traditions. Uh, you go into almost any Catholic church in the world, and you're going to have a crucifix with a body on it, usually a bleeding heart. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's going to be pretty graphic. And yet you go into most Protestant churches, and you're going to find an empty cross, just the symbol with no body there. Uh, because of our belief in the power of the resurrection. And what Paul seems to be saying here is, <clears throat> to the audience of the, of the Christians in Corinth, he seems to be saying, we cannot take our eyes off Jesus crucified because that is the scandal that sets this whole thing up. Uh, yes, we're going to talk about Christ resurrected. And yes, Paul does that a lot. But the central image you cannot forget that set this in motion is the crucifixion. And I think, uh, as in so many things, um, there are two kinds of Christians in the world. Uh, there are those who want to skip past crucifixion and get to resurrection. And there are those who also sort of like to linger on crucifixion and not so eager to get to resurrection because, you know, whatever. <clears throat> and we see this play out a lot in our, in our own view of uh, theology. We see it play out during the Easter season every year uh, when uh, so many Christians just want to skip through all of the pain of Holy Week and go straight to Easter uh, three weeks in advance. And then there are those of us saying, but wait a minute, <laughs> you can't have the resurrection without the crucifixion. And so uh, here's Paul chiming in on this. <clears throat> Throughout all of his writings, uh, Paul emphasizes a contrast between weak and strong. And this passage is another example of that. Uh, 
Another place we can see this is in 2 Corinthians 4, 7, where he says, we have this treasure in earthen vessels or jars of clay. And also in 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10, where he says, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness, so I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, then I am strong. This is a an ongoing theme in Paul's writings that we see here, uh, and he's portraying himself as coming in weakness to proclaim the message of Christ. Now, uh, on the one hand, and we'll say more about this in a moment, don't be fooled by, by Paul's claim that um, he does not have lofty words or wisdom. Uh, what he's doing here is trying to uh, set up a contrast uh, to the power of the cross. But he's also following a common rhetorical device of this era where, hi Shannon and John Eric, uh, he's also following a common rhetorical device of this era where those who are good orators uh, will tell you they are not uh, in order to, um, it, it's just, it was good form. Uh, is I think the best thing to say. It, it was polite, it was the polite thing to do. And we know though that Paul clearly had persuasion uh, because we saw this in his previous life as a tormentor of Jesus and the followers of Jesus. And it was, uh, we, we see it throughout the rest of the New Testament where he has the ability to sway people. So this is more than false humility here. It's, he, he's not putting on in, in this regard. His primary object, objective, and this is the important point, is to point to Christ, not to himself. He wants to remove any attention that could fall on him. The point is that the Christians in Corinth were not convinced to follow Jesus by a show, by a production, by theatrics, but they were convinced by the message of the cross. And there's so much application here for churches today that are built around production values. What is it that drew you to Christ? And what is it that keeps you following Christ? Do you go for the show or do you go for the message? And this is one of the great uh, dilemmas of modern Christianity as so much of the church has become a production uh, more than content. Uh, this is a good place for me to pause and say, uh, for those of you who came in after the very beginning, I'm realizing as we've done this for several weeks now that there's a 60 to 90 second lag between when I say something here in my living room and you hear it wherever you are. And so whenever I ask you to make a comment or ask a question, uh, it may, uh, you don't even hear me say that for a minute. And rather than me sit here and look stupid for uh, a minute to a minute and a half, uh, just staring at you, uh, all along the way through the lesson today, if you have a comment or a question, just feel free to type it in in real time and I'll get to it as I can. Uh, and just remember, everyone sees those. Uh, so uh, don't make a snide comment about the person uh, across the screen from you. Um, but do ask your questions and make your comments as, as we go. All right. So Paul is talking to the Corinthians about the power of the cross and the central message of the cross to Christianity. Um, and I think this is just something worth pondering. Uh, the difference in the way we think of the cross, empty, occupied, right? Uh, there is value in seeing the cross both ways because the cross cannot be empty if it hasn't been occupied. Uh, and we need to be reminded of both. But for his purposes, with the church at Corinth, Paul is talking to them about Christ crucified because this is the thing that sets the message apart in this culture, because we talked last week about the word scandalon. Uh, this is the scandal of the faith, uh, that here they are following uh, a rabble rouser who uh, was put to death in the most uh, heinous way, 
the most humiliating way. And here is the figure, the, the leader of our faith. Uh, that is a scandal in itself. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm going to have to uh, get my uh, iPad here to read that. Jan says, when I was in high school and became so confused by a friend who wanted to argue the benefit of her cultish religion, this is the verse my dad pointed me to. He said, just remember Christ and him crucified, and that's the focus. Uh, hi, Eberson. Glad to have you join us, too. Thank you, Jan, for that comment. I think that's so true. Um, it is exactly the point that we've got to come back around. And we're going to be talking about that more within this lesson because all of us, uh, even the most devout Christians, are tempted to take our eyes off Jesus and focus on something else um, instead. And maybe sometimes not even know that we're doing that. Uh, so excellent, excellent point. All right. Uh, I want you to uh, pause for a moment in verse 1. And look at the word that in the NRSV is translated mystery. Depending on what translation you're looking at, it may not say mystery. It may say testimony. Uh, I read it as, uh, I did not come proclaiming the mystery of God to you in lofty words or wisdom. Um, the oldest available manuscripts of 1 Corinthians show two different words here. Sometimes there's a Greek word that's translated testimony, and sometimes there's a Greek word that's translated mystery. And there's nearly equal evidence for both, both views. And so it's quite an interesting debate uh, about how this came to be. The NRSV uh, translators chose to go with, with the word mystery. And I actually like that because uh, there's a simil similar reference in other places in Paul's writings, notably in Colossians chapter 2, verse 2, where he says, I want their hearts to be encouraged and united in love so that they may have all the riches of assured understanding and have knowledge of God's mystery. That is Christ himself. And there's also a connection to the word mystery associated with God just ahead in today's reading, we haven't gotten there yet, in chapter 2, verse 7, uh, which is talking about God's wisdom being secret and hidden. Well, I, I think the idea of mystery in the Christian faith is an important one. And there's some good and there's some bad to it, uh, depending on how you handle it. The bad side is when folks make the Christian faith, or the Bible, like a secret society where you have to know the secret code to get in, or you have to have the secret decoder ring to understand these deep mysteries that are only available to the initiated. Or my big pet peeve is when people make the message of the Bible more complicated than it actually is. Uh, these are exclusionary tactics that make the gospel about us and our control. I'm gonna say that one more time. The bad kind of mystery of the faith is leading to exclusionary tactics that make the gospel about us and our control. You've got to go through me and my interpretation to understand what God is saying. The good side of seeing mystery in the faith is when we have a respect and an awe that God's ways are higher than our ways and that we don't know everything and will not know everything. I believe we need to maintain some sense of the mystery of God and God's work in the world, lest we elevate ourselves to be the divine. Think about the Tower of Babel, for example. Think about other Old Testament stories uh, where we're told that the people, even Adam and Eve, uh, were seeking to become like God. Uh, and that's, that, is, uh, that is breaking one of the commandments, uh, for starters. But this idea that we can understand everything if we just have the secret decoder ring uh, is really too much. We need to believe that there is a divine mystery that is greater than ourselves, because I believe there actually is. 
<clears throat> this kind of good mystery is also an exclusionary tactic, but it excludes us supplanting God. Whereas a bad use of mystery excludes other people by our doing, a good use of mystery excludes us ourselves from taking the very place of God. Now, <clears throat> what is this mystery of God? It's not that difficult, and it's plainly spoken by Paul. <clears throat> he explains this in Colossians chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. The mystery that has been hidden throughout the ages and generations, but has now been revealed to saints, to them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is... Here's the big reveal, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Jesus is the mystery of God. Now, I made it sound like that settles everything. And in a sense, it does, but it also doesn't because to say Jesus is the answer, uh, Jesus is the answer to the mystery, is still uh, to leave a lot unanswered, right? because that assumes we can know fully uh, everything about Jesus. Uh, and that is the thing that we keep working on uh, in our faith. I hope this makes sense uh, to you. Uh, there is a mystery of God's work in the world. Jesus is the answer to the mystery. Uh, the one anticipated, the one who came, the one who is coming again, uh, Jesus is the one who holds it all together. And simply knowing the name of Jesus helps us in that, but it does not grant us full knowledge of everything God knows. I, I want to move next to say that throughout this portion of Scripture, Paul demonstrates tremendous humility. Uh, thank you, Beth. <laughs> uh, Paul demonstrates tremendous humility, uh, as we previously noted, yet he could have easily had a right to boast, to exercise pastoral authority, to make himself the center of attention, because he was the, he was the big person in the, in the room, right? I mean, he, he had the reputation. He had the uh, apostolic authority on him, and yet he declines that over and over and over again. And Paul tells us, and he models for us, the kind of leaders we should be and the kind of leaders we should follow. And yet, how easily throughout the ages have Christians been duped into following and even worshiping human figures who are not God, but whose outsized egos demand that they be treated like God. This is blasphemy and idolatry. It is not a new phenomenon, even though it is present among us today. It goes all the way back. Uh, throughout time, we have seen figures whose own ego needs cause them to want people to worship them in place of God. This was uh, the whole Roman Empire uh, thing. And so there, it, it, it's, it's a never ending story, but it's one we've got to be attentive to. Paul says the solution to this is to keep your eyes on Jesus, to make Jesus the center of the picture, the focal point of the picture. I was having a conversation with a friend uh, this past week who said a really profound line. I wrote it down, and I think we're going to write something about this together. Um, and his line was, Fundamentalism has a problem with Jesus. And that is so true. Uh, for a branch of Christianity that claims to be so full of love for uh, God and the Bible, uh, it is difficult sometimes to see the Jesus in the judgmental and fear-based forms of faith known within fundamentalism. Uh, I, I had a pastor friend years ago who was an astute observer of preaching. And he told me when I was a young seminarian, 
He said, pay attention to preachers uh, because there's two kinds of preachers in the world. There are those who love to preach the gospels and there are those who love to preach the epistles. And they are typically not doing the same thing. Unless, of course, they're following a discipline of preaching from the lectionary, uh, like happens at Wilshire. And the point is that uh, you can get... A lot of fundamentalism uh, does not like the red letters of the Bible uh, because Jesus is all about inclusion and grace and mercy and uh, eating with sinners, right? Uh, and you can go other places in the Bible and find much more structure, uh, many more rules uh, on this. Um, how often does the witness of the church sound much more like Jesus's accusers than like Jesus himself? Remember, if Jesus had obeyed the strict Jewish law and the Roman law, he would not have been murdered. So we don't need to be saying to Jesus, if you would just obey the law of Jesus, you'd be okay. That was not the point. Uh, understanding this, Paul says, requires the work of the Holy Spirit. And it's not the result of apologetics or deep study or rule following or scorekeeping. It is about opening yourself to the work of the Holy Spirit. Real power, Paul says, real power comes from the Spirit amplifying and magnifying the mission of Jesus. So if you go back to our thinking about this painting that we began with, uh, the Spirit has the ability to allow us to look at life's picture and understand it in the context of Jesus. The central figure is Christ crucified and how we understand everything going on around it and our place in it relates to that. All right, just a reminder, if you have a question or comment, type it in at any point. We'll take them as they come. Uh, we're going to move on to verse 6 at this point. Uh, we're going to read uh, verses 6 through 13, uh, if you have your Bible open. Yet among the mature we do speak wisdom, though it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to perish. But we speak God's wisdom, secret and hidden, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the human heart conceived, what God has prepared for those who love him, these things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God, for what human being knows what is truly human except the human spirit that is within? So also no one comprehends what is truly God's except the spirit of God. All right, get to your question in a minute, Carla. Uh, now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit that is from God, so that we may understand the gifts bestowed on us by God. And we speak of these things in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual things to those who are spiritual. So Carla's asking, how do you discern the Spirit moving in you from your own ego? And uh, uh, with all uh, deference to Susan Leonard, I'd say probably um, therapy is a good place to start uh, on that. Self-awareness is the key, I think. How do we differentiate between our own wants and the work of the Spirit in us. Now, sometimes what the Spirit leads us to do is what we want to do anyway. But sometimes what the Spirit leads us to do is not what we want to do. It's what we're afraid to do. And this is the, this is the challenge. Uh, and it takes, I think, prayer and discernment. Uh, but above all within that, I think it takes the ability to have critical thinking um, which seems to be in short supply these days, and to set aside your own interests and to think, if I am open to God's spirit, what is God saying to me? And this, this is a point where I think um, 
I mean, certainly the spirit can move um, through Zoom and through where we are in our homes. But I, th I think one of the things we're losing right now is the ability to be in holy places uh, where there is a palpable uh, spirit of, of an assembled group. Because how often have you found answers sitting in a Sunday school class or in the sanctuary or praying uh, in, in a, a space that seems to be sacred? Uh, and Not to say that home cannot be, right? And I think God can speak to us anywhere. But um, we may be less focused in that. And I think you raise a really wonderful question about that, Carla. And uh, let me read Linda's comment. Uh, right, uh, Linda, we're so desperate to know God that we're willing to fall for someone who sets himself up as God. Yes, and you know, this, this goes back to what I said a little bit earlier about uh, throughout time, uh, there have been and there will continue to be people whose egos are so grand that they demand and need that we worship them instead of God. Uh, and that it, it really supplants God. And here's Paul's message again, the power of the cross the power of the cross, keeping your eyes upon Jesus. I'm not going to say this is easy, uh, so don't, don't, uh, don't think of me as the answer man who's got all this down. So in, in this passage we just read, Paul is back to riffing on this word wisdom, which we talked about last week, and I don't want to rehash all that. Uh, Paul sees two kinds of wisdom here. The wisdom of this age, and the wisdom of God, the wisdom of this age and God's wisdom. Now, the wisdom of this age, in Paul's view, is the thirst for political power and control over people, the elevation of self and self-interest, the clawing over other people to get to the top, to appear to be a winner. And we see this play out in so many ways that it becomes all obsessive with people, uh, people we know and people we observe, uh, all around. This is a, a very easily observed phenomenon. That is the wisdom of this age. God's wisdom is, and you probably guessed it by now, the way of Jesus. Uh, none of the rulers of this age understood this, Paul says, or they would not have crucified the king of glory. This is a wonderful statement. And he's actually giving them some credit, those who put Jesus to death. Because what he's saying is, if they had understood this, they would not have done what they did. Whereas I think we want to say they refused to understand what they should have understood. And Paul is simply saying their actions were driven because they did not understand. And here we are back to the crucified Christ as the central figure. When we refuse to see the wisdom of the person and the work and the model of Jesus, we join the crucifixion crowd wanting to arrest Jesus for not obeying the law, for not being quiet, for not getting along, for not doing what he was told, for not submitting to the rulers of this age. When we refuse to see the wisdom of the person and work of Jesus, we join the crucifixion crowd. Paul says the crucifixion, Christ crucified, must be the filter or the lens through which we see all of life's painting. If your perspective draws you to anything other than Jesus as the central figure, your perspective is skewed. This made me think of um, the fact that there was some wisdom in this old, uh, y'all remember the WWJD bracelet a phenomenon of some years ago? I think most of y'all are old enough to remember this. Uh, the little bracelet that you, that you could get that, that was a daily reminder in your actions to ask this question, what would Jesus do before you responded? The problem, I think, is that a lot of folks who wore the bracelet and bore the bumper sticker on their cars didn't understand what Jesus did <laughs> or what Jesus would have done. 
uh, they attached the wrong meaning to the slogan and made Jesus a law-enforcing, judgmental exclusionary. All in Christian love, of course. They didn't understand the wisdom of God in trying to follow Jesus, and they ended up joining the crucifixion party instead while claiming to follow Jesus. Tom Wright, the British theologian, likens the problem of these two ages to musicians who are singing or playing in one key and miss the cue for a key change. They're still playing in the old key, which never meshes with the new key. When they keep singing the wisdom of the world, and when you do that, when you keep singing the wisdom of the world, you will not harmonize with the music of God's wisdom revealed in Jesus, because Jesus is the key change in the song. And the world's wisdom is fading away. We've got to begin singing and playing in the key of Jesus, which is God's wisdom. Well, um, the next big key to the puzzle Paul lays out for us here is, is the Holy Spirit. And we've talked about this just briefly. I wanna say more about this. Uh, Here's my third profound thought for the day. Institutional Christianity, and Judaism for that matter, does not like the Holy Spirit because the Spirit cannot be controlled by institutions. Institutions, deeply organized religion, wants to deal in settled law with boundaries and regulations and consequences for misdeeds. We want things black and white and understood. Just tell me what to do. Institutions want the reading of scripture to be closed and not open for further understanding. Institutions like things neat and tidy and without any gray areas. But the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, calls us out of the law, out of tradition, out of binary, this way or that way thinking, out of enforcement and into a new kind of freedom. The Spirit continues to reveal Jesus to us, even though Jesus is not physically present among us. And to borrow a phrase from our uh, UCC church kin, they have, have had an ad campaign going for a number of years that says, God is still speaking. And I think this is, there's just a lot of wisdom here because the way God is still speaking is through the Holy Spirit. And this gets back to Carla's question earlier about how do we know uh, when the Spirit is speaking to us. And there are certainly a lot of examples throughout Scripture of people who heard the voice of God, uh, which we would say was the voice of the Spirit. And many of us have had those kinds of experiences ourselves where we've received guidance at some, uh, or encouragement or comfort at some key moment when we needed that. And many of us understand at least partially uh, what that is, and yet we still struggle uh, with it. Institutional religion wants everything settled. Uh, the institutional religion wants policies and procedures that cannot be amended. And Holy Spirit religion doesn't settle into that too well, uh, which is why so many of us in the Christian tradition don't talk very much about the Holy Spirit. And yet Jesus said he would leave the Spirit to guide us. And we shut ourselves off from that too often. God is still speaking. Now, this is highly unsettling to people who need to know all the rules of play in advance. And it's actually the root of a lot of conflict in the church, local and at large today. Uh, when you think back on Wilshire's uh, LGBTQ inclusion study, it's just one example of this. I could go to any number of examples um, on this. It's certainly even our membership and baptism policy discussion that preceded that uh, would fall under the same thing. Uh, where too often uh, there was an inability to acknowledge that we might 
need to listen anew to the work of the Holy Spirit to interpret even scripture for us today. Uh, that we can never be at the point where we say we, we've got it all locked down. Uh, and I think institutional religion is the, is the lock and key religion uh, on this. Uh, you've heard me say this illustration before, but I think it's straight to the point. Um, I, I had a person come to me during Wilshire's debates and say, you're asking me to believe that it's possible that what my parents and grandparents taught me in interpreting the Bible was wrong on this one issue. And if I believe that, what else did they teach me that was wrong? In other words, if I start pulling that thread, what am I gonna be left with? Uh, it's too dangerous to pull that. To which my response is, what is the faith? Is the faith in your parents and your grandparents? And are they inerrant interpreters of scripture? I hope not, right? Uh, because the spirit calls us to listen today. Uh, when we get to the book of Revelation, uh, there's a phrase used over and over again, listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. And I think that's the motto that we need to have here as well. Okay, uh, Paul here is talking about a kind of spiritual maturity that doesn't have to do with how much of the Bible you have memorized, but how much of the work of Jesus you embody, guided by the Spirit. What Paul is going to be saying to the Corinthians throughout this book is, here is the ideal of the way you ought to live, and here is where you are. Look at the gap. Uh, one commentator I read, like a choral singer who needs to get the singers to raise their pitch uh, because they're singing flat, and so what he, may, he or she may do is actually give them a pitch that's a little higher than where they need to be, just in order to come up to where they need to be. And there are times when we read Paul uh, and we say, what he's asking is impossible. I can't sing that high. And yet we can sing higher. Uh, we can go a little more. And Paul is calling us upward uh, into that. Now, um, look in chapter two, verse 13. Who are these spiritual people that Paul is referencing here? He says only spiritual people understand spiritual things. Paul teaches elsewhere that all believers, all believers have received the Holy Spirit. So we cannot make a case for the kind of Pentecostal theology of a second baptism in the Holy Spirit. What Paul seems to be talking about here is those who open themselves to the work of the Spirit, to be guided by the Spirit. Spiritual people are open to and guided by the work of the Spirit. And Paul, throughout this letter, is going to be encouraging the Corinthians to open their hearts, to allow the Spirit of God to lead them through their conflict, through their trouble, uh, and they're going to struggle with this. So we're not alone in this. I have a couple of takeaways that I want to summarize from today's lesson, but let me remind you, if you have comments or questions, please keep typing those in and we will, we will address those um, as, as we come. So just put them in as, as, as you would like. Thanks for the, all of you who've been doing that uh, along the way. So from my perspective, what are the big takeaways from today's lesson? Um, number one, keep Jesus in the center. It's not enough to keep Jesus first as an old, this is ironic for this week, Jerry Falwell Sr. slogan said. I, I was reminded when I was typing this up last night that when I was a kid, um, y'all are going to just die laughing at this. Uh, uh, you know, raised in a very conservative uh, Baptist home in Oklahoma, uh, I used to listen to Jerry Falwell Sr. on the radio uh, in my room, and he had this big campaign, uh, Jesus First, and you could write in and get a Jesus First plastic pen, um, which I did, and uh, you're supposed to wear it, you know, uh, to, ind to indicate, it's sort of a precursor to WWJD. 
And I was thinking about this slogan, Jesus first. Um, and I think that's insufficient in a way. What matters is the kind of Jesus you put in first place. There's, I've heard a lot of people saying their life, life order is uh, Jesus first, others second, and yourself third. Okay, that's nice, joy. I want to know what kind of Jesus you're putting first. Which version of Jesus are you putting first? Be sure it's the real Jesus and not the self-made Jesus. And it's not just to make Jesus first, but instead to make Jesus center, the focus of the painting of our lives. There is a difference there. Second, I think Paul is telling us in today's lesson that we've got to be open to the work of the Spirit. The way of this world is passing, and the way of God's new world is breaking in. The Spirit is our guide and our translator to help us make that journey, to make that transition. And the Spirit may speak, and we may not listen. And boy, is that hard to be quiet enough sometimes, to set aside our own agenda enough, to realize that we could have misunderstood something, to acknowledge that our view might be wrong, to think about things in a new way. This is what the Spirit continually calls us to do, which is why so many of us don't like to think about the Holy Spirit. But Paul, Paul here, is an advocate for the work of the Spirit in our lives. And I think uh, that is important for us today. All right, Charlene says she attended 830 Church, and it was good, and it goes along with the lesson uh, today. Thank you for that good time. Just a reminder, uh, the worship service is now available anytime on Sunday after 830. And... Um, uh, it's good to be with you all. Uh, please send me a note if there's anything you'd like me to know um, along the way. I sure do miss seeing all of you. And thank you to Charlene for keeping us up to date um, with so many things uh, that are going on. Please, uh, please let us know of the needs that you have. Um, all right, Linda, Linda has a comment here. When it goes over, I gotta get my iPad out. Uh, uh, Thank you, Linda. Yeah, very good. And Dave, I saw your comment earlier too. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, let's pray together. Lord, hear our prayers and uh, hear our confessions that we are frail children of dust and earthen vessels. We want to be filled with your treasure and your glory and we pray that you would help us. Uh, help us to keep our eyes upon Jesus and to be open to the work of the Spirit in our lives, around and through us, even in these difficult days. We pray for each member of our class who's struggling in different ways today. We pray for Jan in particular and your strength and your healing for her. Hear our prayers, Lord, through Jesus Christ. Amen. Bye, y'all.